It is Legends Territory, Scotty Braun and Eric Kratz. And thank you to the MLB Players Alumni Association for setting this up. And you can hit up baseballalumni.com for more info on your favorite former players. Quick reminder, if you're watching on YouTube, the podcast version of this show is on Apple and Spotify. And now let's bring in dude, the do-it-all man. Is that a fair way to put this when you're going through the resume? Former player, former coach, longtime GM of the Phils. Nice little run there. Ruben Amaro Jr. swinging by and now broadcaster too. So literally filling the bingo card in baseball. <laughs> Ruben, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Scotty, and uh, good to see you too, Eric. It's uh, nice to be with some guys that I've worked with before. Kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Ruben was not only my GM, my first prominent GM with the Phillies, but he was also a co-worker on the Phillies broadcast booth. He was TV because yeah. he has a face for TV. I have a face for radio. <laughs> so, but yeah, Ruben's been everywhere and and nowhere, right, Ruben? Yeah, done done a little bit of everything. I actually just and then I stayed in Philadelphia. I was born and raised here, so uh, didn't go too far. But um, it's been great for me to get back to Philly uh, after you know taking a little bit of a hiatus in Boston and in New York. And uh, I've really enjoyed you know doing the old broadcast thing. What's been your favorite job? in baseball so like did, did you like your playing career and we were joking about stats Kratz always does the same with some of the dudes that we have on our shows um or you know some of the years with the fills where you guys were a powerhouse you know it's funny I um I was just asked this question by uh by a young group of kids in a in a uh, broadcasting camp and it's really hard for me to like distinguish what my actual favorite, I mean, obviously playing in the major leagues is like a dream come true for like every, you know, aspiring baseball player. Um, so I would say that that part of it and playing with, you know, some of the greatest players on the planet, I got a chance to be with guys and play with uh, really good players, you know, the Darren Daltons and Lenny Dykstra's, uh, Kurt Schilling. Uh, then I went over and played with guys like, I don't know. I mean, I played with guys like Manny Ramirez and Jim Tomey and uh, Sandy Alomar. I played with Hall of Famers, uh, you know, guys like Eddie Murray and, uh, you know, Dave Winfield. So I guess playing um, has was my favorite. I will say that I love being a GM, but when I got back onto the field as a coach uh, with the Boston Red Sox, that was just a blast. We won the division two years in a row. I felt like uh, like I was back playing again. Uh, the coaching staff, John Farrell, the manager who hired me, um, then the coaching staff, you know, Brian Butterfield and uh, Carl Willis and Chili Davis. I mean, guys that I played with, Vic Rodriguez, uh, just uh, Gary D. Sarcino, who's now one of my best baseball friends uh, and best buddies uh, uh, that I have. I mean, just it was it was awesome. It was like being back in the clubhouse again. And that clubhouse feeling is like none other, you know. Ruben, are you a winner? Because, look, you played with the Phillies. Not like Phillies 93, Indians 95. Then you were a GM, and you guys won the World Series and went five straight playoffs. Then you are with the Red Sox, went to the playoffs twice. Would you consider yourself a winner in every single spot is that something that you grew up learning from being in the fat like explain that to me yeah you know it's funny eric i've always been like one of those kids as from a young childhood i mean my dad played in the major leagues for 11 years um baseball and sports were in our family a lot i was one of those kids who grew up like like having to win everything i wanted to be the best baseball player soccer player student whatever the case may be for whatever reason, I've always driven to uh, to a high standard for myself, maybe to the point where it was maybe too much at times. But um, even as a little kid, I put a lot of heat on myself. But um, I mean, from ping pong to tennis to whatever the case may be, playing, you know, war and cards, I always wanted to win. And so um, I was just around winning a lot. And when I was bat boying in the, uh, from 80, 81, 82 and 83, kind of like part-time bat boy in 80, but my dad was part of that team. The Phillies won the world series in 80. They were back in the playoffs in 81. 
Um, they were a contending team in 82 and they went to the world series in 83. So I was part of that whole culture, uh, as a bat boy. And I don't know, I did, went to the, co- I went to the, you know, college world series twice when I was at Stanford, we won it in 87, uh, when I was one of the captains that, that year in 87. And so I don't know, I just, to me, I feel like what's the point of being on the field and competing if you're not competing to win. And uh, I always felt like that was an important part of who I am and and what I'm about. It's been kind of cool. That that is really cool, and it's something that I think people, you know, everyone always talks about, like clubhouse chemistry and all that kind of thing. That kind of stuff matters. That kind of stuff matters, and it shows. It shows, but in in other ways, like what's a story where you you took the winning too far. Where you, where you were (laughs) like, oh crap, I shouldn't have done that. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think that's exactly what happened. And probably the the beginning of my demise as a GM was that, you know, when I took over, when you take over a team, like how many guys in the world get to take over a team that just won a world series or a championship. So in 2008, I was the assistant GM, Pat Gillick decides he wants to retire and David Montgomery hires me as the GM, you know, very rarely do you become the GM of a team that actually just won the World Series. I mean, you're usually coming in on a team that just fired somebody and you're, you know, rebuilding or whatever the case may be. And my job at the time, I felt, and I think that the fans deserved it, was to try to continue to win, to try to get back there and just keep winning, baby. And so, and that was really my goal. And that was always sort of my mindset. So in 2009, we go back to the World Series. Unfortunately, we... Joe Girardi and his Yankees beat us um, in, I guess, five games or six games. And then um, and then we had, you know, then I did some more stuff to try to make the team better in 10 and in 11. Um, I think 11 was the best ball club that I've ever seen on a on a baseball field, to be frank with you. We could not get past the Cardinals that year. And and then we started to have some breakdowns with some of our players. And at that point, instead of like seeing sort of the forest for the trees, we kept after it. And, uh, and we probably at some point, maybe in 12 or 13, a little earlier, we probably should have started the rebuild, um, and the retool, which is a hard thing to do in Philadelphia after you've won, you know, five straight years of division titles. Uh, but that was, you know, that was a sort of the cycle we were in and, and, uh, should have probably should have started doing it a little earlier instead of, instead of trying to push the envelope. Ruben, is that up to you, though? Like, take me inside the dynamic of mm-hmm. front office leader, ownership. Fans always think that they actually, you know, are being heard. And maybe they are by some, right? I, I'm always fascinated by the ownership process and the relationship because they're all different. But they're such a huge part, probably in baseball more than in any other sport, right? There's technically not a salary cap. We have teams that are all over the map in terms of how they're run. And Kratzy can tell you, too. I'm a, at least from the outs, I don't know him well, but John Middleton, like he, he knows the game, he's spending money on the team and all of that. But, ju- but back to this for a moment, like, was that your choice where you're sitting there going, Hey, let's just keep gunning it and, and trading everything away and making sure we sign everyone we can to be the best team we can. Or is ownership saying, Hey, we're not, we're not like rebuilding it's Philadelphia and we were so good for so long. Yeah, great. I mean, Scotty, it's 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 a, a dynamic that's very difficult to do, especially when you're in a big market, and especially when you've had a lot of success over the years. I think um, I think it's a collaborative effort. You know, I can't take. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to throw like my owner old ownership under the bus that hey, you know, you should have done this and you should have no, no. Um, I you know, I I made the baseball decisions, and they gave me the leeway to do that. David Montgomery gave me. You know, it was a beauty of what David was about he was on top of things pretty significantly, but he also, you know, he allowed you to make the decisions based on, you know, you know, what you felt was right for the organization. And, you know, I wanted to win. I want, and I felt like, and I still feel this way that the fans deserve to get the best product they can possibly get. And um, whether it's in Minnesota or it's Kansas city or it's New York or Philadelphia, I do believe in like, putting the, your best foot forward and trying to make, you know, the best decisions for your organization. It's a cool thing to see what's going on with the Reds now. I think it's awesome. I think the fact, uh, you know, the fact that they've had some success, I know it's a weak division, 
but for them to to be in this position, I'm happy for David Bell, who's a good friend and uh, someone I respect a lot. Um, and it's just a cool thing to see. A guy, uh, Sean Pender, is a guy who is you know was a Philadelphia guy who's now like the player development director over there in Cincinnati. He's changing the culture and putting a winning culture of baseball back into Cincinnati. And I think those are all really, really good stories. But I always felt like, you know what? Um, it, those, those are my decisions. Those are as the, as the proprietor uh, of the, and, you know, the leader of the organization, man, you know, you sometimes, uh, you, you have to make, sometimes you have to make a little bit better decisions. And, um, you know, I probably should have peeled it back one year early rather than one year, one, one year late. All right. So now you kind of, you know, you're feeding some of those regrets or whatever, but in the moment you were confident about your decision. You're always very confident. So I need to know how confident, because we've talked about this before. You would like to be a GM again, you know, some or president, whatever that new logo is, you know, you kind of need to have people pushing you and selling you in those corners. What's the number it would take for you to be the president or GM of the A's right now? The right Oakland now. A's. Right now. <laughs> John Fisher is actually calling me right now. I got to get my – oh, I didn't have my phone, so we oh, missed here, your call. Here. I got it. That's yours. It's too big. It's too big. <laughs> I mean, what it's a tough uh, It's a tough situation over there. There's no question about it. I mean, it may be a great end up being a great situation. I don't know whether Vegas is the right spot. I hope it is. Um I guess it's going to happen, but there's so many still some um, hoops and ladders to jump over. Um, uh, listen, I, I love the game of baseball. I love what I'm doing now as a broadcaster. If someone were going to give me the keys to the castle and say, I want you to run this organization the way you want to run it uh, and valuing scouting and valuing evaluation in a, in a, in a way that uh, that is not so analytically driven, and I am allowed to do that, utilizing every one of the pieces of information and someone who gave me the reins to do that, then I'd be all in, man. But if I'm if I would be shackled with having to do, run an organization a certain way, then then I I don't know that I would want to do that. I really don't. Um, I love the game. I think that that uh, we've done a couple of disservices to the game. Um and I think we've done a disservice to the people who really did know the game and understand the game and contributed to it in a very positive way, po positive way. Um, I hope that the pendulum swings back to the point where, and even, you know, the commissioner and I think Theo and all those other people in, in the commissioner's office, I think realized we, the product of the game's got to get better. It needs to be better. And how would you do it? How would you do it? Let, let's say, let's say you took over the A's tomorrow. And they said, okay, tell us how long you're going to need. Tell us what you need. What would you do? You know, I think it's all about scouting and player development. I think uh, one, of the, one of the things I learned from Pat Gillick is that if you don't bring quality players and talent into your system and you don't have people who can uh, evaluate actual talent, then you got no chance. No talent, no chance. And it's not just talent, but it's also – you know, people's makeup, how they understand and play the game. And in this day and age, we have our young kids. We don't have a lot of kids who actually really think about winning baseball games. We have people at, in our industry who care more about their production than they do about actually winning. And I would love to be able to treat, create a culture of winning. That's what I believe in. We talked about this from the very beginning. Um, I want winning people and winning players. And if we can do that and we can do that consistently with the with the people that we um, that we hire and evaluate the people that are evaluating those kids, I think that's the way to go. You got to have you have to have your basis. Any team that has success or sustained success are the teams that bring people from their own system or acquire people who have have a long, you know, you can control and have long term success with are people that uh, that understand your culture and and uh, and, and are and buy in. And I think that's that's the way to do it. Um, I just don't know. I do think that there's a melding process of, of being able to utilize, you know, your your traditional evaluation uh, processes, but there and, and, and you can meld those with some of the analytics information there's out there, but you can't run your organization 
based on solely on uh, analytical evaluations. It's not the, we, the people are not widgets. The people are human beings. And I think it's really important to distinguish what it is that a, that a player can do and provide for you based on his makeup and, uh, and, and, and other factors as well. You don't want to be shackled as a GM. Would you shackle your manager and make the lineup for him like some GMs are doing? No, I, I think I've always been one of those guys that I, I feel like if I'm hiring the right person, then that person will make the right decisions in his in his job, whether it's a player development director, whether it's a a manager, it's a uh, someone who's running our analytics program. I would love to hire people and allow them to do their jobs. Is it my job to oversee them? Absolutely, unequivocally. But I want to hire people that I'm confident in and try to help guide them to have success and give them the autonomy to do that. I think autonomy is a huge thing for a variety of reasons. In the workplace, you want to feel like, hey, this guy's allowing me to do my job and um, and trust me to do that job properly. And for me, um, there's nothing wrong with making suggestions, but to la- uh, to have someone who has never played a game of baseball ever tell me who should be playing in the lineup and where, I think is a disservice to the manager and it's just not the way to run a, run a business. That's, that's my feeling. Uh, and if people don't like it, tough shit. I mean, that's, that's, that's life. I just believe that um, you should be hiring people and giving them uh, the autonomy to do their jobs properly. And then if you feel like they're not, then have the discussion and, and, and try to figure out how we can get to the right space. Did you have conversations like that? Like, have you had, you know, good debates um, or intense battles even, right? With people that can't relate to, to playing the game or being in any of the roles. I mean, you're coming from the the other side where you've been in a front office, but then the playing experience, the coaching experience, even after the GM experience. So um, obviously you're a listener. I mean, we both know you well, but at the same time, if someone's going to stomp in somewhere and just tell you what to do and say, this is, you know, this is what my, uh, my spreadsheet says, screw you. There's going to be a problem, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I ran across that when I went to Boston um, and we were not super analytically driven. Actually, Dave Dombrowski was pretty as he is with the Philadelphia Phillies. I mean, he's uh, I think he brings in all the information. He's fairly, you know, kind of old school in his thought process, but we had at times, people come in from the front office, we'd have some meetings and they would say, well, how come we're getting, you know, thrown out on the, out on the base pass 23% of the time. And we've been thrown out on the base. Well, they don't talk about all the, all the, you know, base running that's created runs. All they talk about is the base running that as, you know, as stifled an inning. And I think that there's a lot of things that go on in baseball that, um, that are valued improperly by the analytics folks. The point is to try to win the game. Okay. That's number one. Okay. And whether or not, you know, the spreadsheet says to play this guy somewhere or to, to pitch this guy in a certain way in a certain situation, well, he can't hit a breaking ball, but guess what? If you spin him a breaking ball, there's a man on first base. He can hook it into the hole. That's a first and third situation. All of a sudden there's a, an inning happening. There's just so many different things that, that you cannot, there's no absolutes in baseball. It just doesn't exist. And so I think the trends are definitely there. There's no question about that. There are always trends. Um, But I think there, you have to understand that there's no absolutes in baseball. And, um, and I think that the people have to realize that a little bit better. And the, uh, and, and in addition, I mean, we played the game of baseball and ran the game of baseball in a certain way for a hundred years. It does not mean that we did it wrong for a hundred years. <laughs> and so what has happened is in, with, with a lot of folks who are running the analytics programs and are more heavily analytic, uh, analytically driven is they feel like they, the people that were playing the game prior didn't know what the hell they were doing. Well, that's, that's, that's not right. The game existed and had, we had a lot of success uh, enjoying the game and watching the game and, and entertaining the fans for a long, long time. And I think this 10 year or 15 year experiment where analytics is now driving, you know, all the evaluation, 
I think that people are realizing it wasn't such a great experiment. It was an experiment that failed in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's this is not the stock market. It's sports. Now, you did say that winning was number one. I, I disagree. I believe that's maybe number two. Number one is definitely making money. Most of the that's gatekeepers probably, that of the sport right. are, are saying... <laughs> How am I making money? This has to be profitable and all of that. So, but don't you win? Don't two. don't you make don't you make money by winning? Oh, so much money! Yes, you would think so. So, so much money, so and they not going hand in things, hand. So this is one of the things that I actually like talk about a little bit with my old school buddies. You know, the the old heads <laughs> is that what is the value actual value of a major league win? I don't know how many millions of dollars the value is. I, I couldn't put it. There, there's got to be an analytical uh, formula to figure out what one win in a major league game actually means. And so shouldn't be the goal. Shouldn't it be the goal if you really want to make money to win as many games as you possibly can, as opposed to losing. And that should be the goal always and forever is to win. And so it shouldn't be, I mean, there shouldn't be any other, you know, thought process. I get it that the owners, they want to make money. They want to build their the equity in their, in their um, franchises and such, but you do that by winning and you do that by, you know, having the best assets you possibly can. Just a thought. Facts. No, <laughs> I mean, it's 100% accurate. It, you win, you make more. Sometimes people oversee that, um, overlook yeah. that, or, yeah. or here's the other part of it that we talk about sometimes. Not every team can be the Rays. Not every team. We even going to say this as something new too, because we smashed the Orioles in the off season because they didn't do anything after making their fans Me sit too. through tank city, right? Like almost everyone and they, did. And they, they did, like, and, they did and they did nothing to improve their team. Well, guess what? They're still pretty damn good. They are. They built, I mean, so they, Go ahead. Scott, you make a great point, man. There's so many ways to get it done. It, it There's not a cookie cutter way. Like the Rays actually, they've acquired a lot of their players. Um, and I, and people think that they're so analytically driven. Guess what? They have the one of the best player development programs going. They develop players who can play baseball and win. And that's a culture that they've set. St. Louis was one of those teams that 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 for years they, they set a culture of winning and I think that that was, you know, they, they sort of set the standard. But um, and now the Cleveland Indians, great pitching development. Los Angeles Dodgers, phenomenal. What they've done to be able to like burn it at both ends. They have a lot of money and they have a great scouting uh, and player development system. There are so many di different ways to get it done. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's one cookie way, cookie cutter way to get it done. And uh, and you see that with some of the teams that are having some success now. So before we get into some fun Philly stuff on this topic, now bigger picture, if you're a commissioner for the day, whether it's rules, business, like any of that stuff, what are you doing? What would you want to do? And it can obviously play off what we're talking about or go in another direction. Like what's next? I mean, without getting into say like, you know, rule changes, which I've loved personally, right? Or yeah. some of them um, that have popped yeah. up recently, where, where would you go? Um, I, I to me, um, I, I think the tooth, tooth, toothpaste is sort of out of the tube. I, I see that the, the commissioner is trying to kind of back off some of the analytics, uh, you know, the, the spending that's going on. I mean, I don't know how owners are justifying the amount of spending and the amount of, you know, that, that for years I heard about streamlining and streamlining. I would expand the draft. We need players in our system. We need we need talent in our system to have a 2015 or 20 uh, round draft is not enough because it doesn't bring in a pool of players that can actually help you win at some point. You don't necessarily have to be a first or second or seventh round guy to make an impact in the, in the major leagues. Um, I would expand that pool. That's that'd be one. Um, I would also continue to expand. You know, I know they, they contracted, you know, some of the minor league teams, why we're taking talent out of our, out of our sport. And I think that there's opportunities there to, 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 you know, not necessarily expand, but, but there, there's, to me, there is no reason to streamline that. I think you got to try to bring talent into your, 
into your organization. Um, I love some of the uh, some of the changes that were made as far as um, particularly the pitch timer. I think it's been excellent. Um, I do think at some point it may be tweaked, and I think there's going to be a reassessment of what goes on. I would think about how um, how they can make it maybe a little bit better or not quite as difficult on the pitching because I, I'm really interested in seeing what's going on in July, August, and September when some of these pitchers are going to get gassed. Uh, we already have a system whereby, you know, we are minimizing the importance of the starting pitcher, and it's just too important. I mean, for a guy to have, you know, throw five innings and for people to celebrate that, is ridiculous because you have to have 400,000 other pitchers handle the rest of your uh, rest of your innings for the season. When you're ha- you know, having your bullpens, having to, having to handle 50% of the innings and do it effectively, that's a really hard thing to do when, when, you know, the, uh, the pool of actual talent and pitching is not all that great. I don't know. One of the things I'd love to do somehow is to change maybe the arbitration process and value the win again and value um, a winning player as opposed to their particular numbers. I don't know how to do that. I think it's one of the most difficult processes um, and it's sort of a necessary evil. But I think if you start uh, valuing winning instead of the individual numbers in some way, shape, or form. I'm not smart enough to figure out how. Um, I think that that's a, I think that that would be an important element of getting our game back to like players who actually want to help the team win as opposed to players who just want to make money for their family, which is important. I'm, I'm with them. But I think it's also, um, I think it'll be better for the sport. It's called a pitch clock, not a pitch timer. We don't need this. We don't need this government TV, <laughs> you know, telling you to call it a pitch timer, all that pitch stuff. Pitch clock, pitch timer, whatever it is. I think that's going to get tweaked a little bit. I also think that a pitcher should have an opportunity to take a timeout an inning. I believe that he should get one timeout an inning. Without so a mound can visit. just take it, yeah, without a mound visit and say, hey, I need, I need 30 seconds to catch my breath and slow down the inning. And I think that's why you're seeing so many crooked numbers because guys just can't slow it up and they're trying to do it. You know, catcher coming out stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. Ruben, you're going to need more than one day to be commissioner because all that (laughs) stuff, all that stuff is great stuff. And I, and I, you know, I, I completely agree with you. We're going to shift to more like Philly stuff now because like, I, I don't even know. I like, I'm like, where do you even want to go? Like, uh, like start with a Chase Utley story because Smut is one of my favorite and he's just, he's in the, he's in the news right now. Like yeah, the guy cool. was, he's over in London. Like he's a, he's a silver, he's a silver back gorilla over in London right now. Like, <laughs> would you ever seen, thought you would have seen Chase Utley as a, what, what's his name? Ambassador. For Ambassador. MLB? Yeah. <laughs> It, it's it's kind of crazy. I mean, I think um, what the one thing I did notice from Chase, which was really cool, he actually came to the Phillies fantasy camp. I went for the first time last year, and he uh, came. I think Jason Worth was there. There was a whole bunch of guys that like you would randomly not be, not see, and he actually enjoyed it. And I got a chance to talk talk with him a little bit, and I it and I've talked to him since he was you know working with the Dodgers uh, as a uh, special assistant to Andrew Friedman and stuff. And you can see that he's still really passionate about the game of baseball. I mean, he loves the game of baseball still. He's got other interests and I think he wanted to go to Europe for his family and he and his wife, or I think it's, you know, giving their kids that opportunity to go to school and in Europe and stuff like that. I think that's been a, uh, that's something they, they they've kind of wanted to do. But I think it's so cool that he is still, um, you know, that passionate about the game. And I see like a different sort of more outgoing chase, you know, who's, you know, for, for reporters, he was like the worst interview in the world. Right. Uh, we, you know, there's some room for improvement and, you know, it was a good game and, you know, at, at the pitcher, you know, it deflected everything. But I think um, the reality of it is what the cool part about it is that chase loves baseball. He wanted to win. He understands the game in a way, and he's pretty cerebral about it, man. I mean, as you well know, um, and it's just cool to have a person like that 
uh, be a an ambassador and to and to want to try to do something to you know create more interest in the game. It's pretty awesome. You think he deserved his moniker as a dirty player? Uh, I don't. I do not. I, and I, as in fact, that slide um, when they talked about the Ruben Tejada slide, I actually blame Ruben Tejada on it because there's no reason for him to turn his back on the play. He catches the ball and he turns the wrong way. And he p- exposes himself. And and to me, I Chase is not trying to hurt somebody. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to stop him from turning the double play so they can keep the inning alive. And so, I, listen, I, I I know that I know in my heart of hearts that there, that Chase would want to do absolutely no malice to any player and to put anybody in that situation. What I do know is he would do anything he possibly can to win a baseball game and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, I just thought that he's a guy that wants to win and do whatever he possibly can, can do to win. Um, and I don't think they deserve, uh, the negativity that was enforced upon him or forced upon him by others, because frankly, that's, there's, first of all, there's no way the ball is going to be a double play. And number two, I think Ruben put himself in a position to, to get himself hurt. Simple. That's my thought. I concur. I concur. All right, let's take it to 2009. You trade for Cliff Lee, and he takes you, essentially took the Phillies on his back, pitched really well into the World Series. You guys fell short in game six to the Yankees, and he was traded. And then you brought in Roy Halladay. Yeah, and it was probably gonna be like my best trade and my worst trade in the <laughs> on the same on the same day. Um, I think the decision to trade him in that situation was pretty pretty much based on the fact that, as we alluded to before, I wanted to try to create some sustained success. So I felt like, you know, bringing in like good quality young players into our system after depleting it with a lot of my trades, that we could have more sustained success. It was a mistake. We should have held him. We should have kept on. We should have kept him in the in the rotation. We ended up signing him back, which was kind of cool. But um, but the reality of it is, I mean, we made a mistake. That was one of the mistakes we made. And and uh, you know, I, I take full responsibility. I do also take full responsibility for getting maybe the best pitcher I've ever seen on a on a baseball field in Roy Halladay. And um, he did not disappoint, man. I mean, he was just spectacular. He was sort of my white whale, and he was the guy that I wanted from the time that I became a GM. In fact, I went into David Montgomery's office one day and said, hey, man, this is my guy. I'm going to go get him if he's ever available, and I got him, and uh, it ended up, uh, you know, being kind of a uh, infamous type of a trade because we ended up moving Cliff Lee in, in the same sort of, uh, you know, same sort of uh, three-way, but um, – Sometimes you make mistakes, but uh, but I I will not uh, I would not change the fact that we ended up getting Roy Halladay out of the deal, and that was really important to us. Was there a chance that you could have kept Cliff and still gotten Doc, or was there like stipulations like, ah, uh, you know, if we don't if we don't shed this, we have to rebuild with this, and we have to get Doc? You know, it wasn't a contingency uh, trade, but we felt like. Um, and we, it wasn't really a money issue. It was more of a talent issue and we felt like, um, we weren't sure we're going to be able to, um, sign Cliff back. And we felt like if we acquired Roy in that acquisition, we would have to sign him long-term and we got that done. And once we got that done, then it sort of set the wheels in motion again. I mean, I think it was a mistake and, uh, and it would have been great to keep him. We did get him back the following year, but um, but we probably should have kept him. Simple but Cliff, as that. Cliff, getting to know Cliff, becoming a friend with Cliff, he wanted to stay, and I know oh, he yeah. had he had some animosity towards that towards that decision. He wanted him and his wife wanted to stay. Jackson was going through such awesome treatment, which ultimately you know he's able to come back and you know use the the hospital and, and helped him sign back. How is that? It's such a crazy dynamic to me because as a player, I was sitting there like, 
I'm talking to Cliff. He's a teammate. You're essentially my boss. And I'm sitting there going, wait, wait, you were pissed at Ruben because he traded you? You signed back here? Like, how how was that for you? Did you have to, like, come – not not that you, like, had your tail between your legs, but did you have to come and say, hey, this is what happened? And, you know, what, what was that situation? Yeah, it was a very dicey uh, situation because we had so many different factors working against us for that Cliff Lee trade, uh, for that Cliff Lee signing. Um, one of them was the Yankees. The biggest one was the Yankees because, it, uh, honestly – there was no way that the Phillies uh, in, at that time were going to be able to like battle the Yankees in a, in a war to try to sign Cliff Lee. I mean, the Yankees could have said, okay, here's $250 million and we would have been out. And so um, we had to stay really, really stealth and quiet about it. Um, but we talked about it. I mean, he knew how important he was to us. He knew, um, you know, I had to have, the, you know, some tough conversations with he and his wife about, you know, um, hey, I didn't, I didn't, you know, we, we didn't ever want to leave, you know, don't, don't break our hearts again and that kind of stuff. And I, I said, listen, the only way that we'd be able to get this done if we keep it as quiet as possible. And we did keep it quiet enough to be able to get the deal done. And that was, that was one of the most coolest things that, um, because in this day and age, man, everything leaks. I mean, Everything leaks. It doesn't matter how quiet you can be. Um, other than maybe the Atlanta Braves pulling out of Atlanta and going, uh, you know, <laughs> to the battery. Um, <laughs> that doesn't, you know, that was pretty stealth. Pretty good job by John Sherholtz. But um, it just doesn't happen that way. And it did. It worked out in an amazing fashion. And we got to get to have him, you know, got to have him back. Fans often will go, oh, let's trade this guy and then we'll get him back next year. You know, like if they're not doing well, there's there's humans um, that are involved. You know, like John Lester gets dealt. He's he's not coming back. Um, and most guys are usually offended if they've been with the team for a while. And and this ties at least partially to ownership because you got to get permission to spend. But when we're yeah, seeing it right now, Marcus Stroman wants to stay with the Cubs. He is on the record. Now, the Cubs are like, you have a contract. Go for it. Just stay in there. He's like, no, I have an opt-out. And obviously, a any human being would take that. So pay me what I deserve. And I don't know the whole story. Obviously, no one totally does. But that's going on right now. If the Cubs you know, fall back, they trade him. I don't think Marcus Stroman's going to be like, sure, first phone call. Yeah, let's talk. Let's. Like, he's probably going to say, pay me more now. You had me in your hands. You know, it's funny. I have a different, uh, I had a different view about opt-outs. I would never want to give an opt-out when I was a GM. And now in, in retrospect, I think now, you know what? Why not give the guy an opt-out? He's going to have to bust his ass and play his rear end off. And that's exactly what you want out of your player, right? It's almost like a guy who's playing for in his last year of a contract. All of a sudden, you know, may have a year or two or he's not as good. And then all of a sudden, boom, guy goes nuts. Um, I don't mind having opt-outs in, in, in deals anymore because I don't mind paying guys who perform because I think that that was an important part of like, like if you perform, you should be paid for performance. Um, I think you have to be intelligent about it, but um, in, in that situation, I mean, the Cubs are probably going to say, Hey, finish off the season, be healthy and we'll come back at you and try to sign your ass. I mean, I would think that that would be the process, but who knows? I mean, that's uh, that's for the Chicago Cubs to deal with. Um, but there was a time when I thought to myself, why would you ever give an opt-out you know, to a player? Now I'm thinking in this day and age, i got no problem with opt-outs because the guy's going to have to pitch or play um, to a certain level that, uh, that if he plays well enough, I mean, first of all, you get, you get the production out of the guy, right? Um, and if he plays well enough, maybe, you know, Okay, maybe you have to pay him more, but that's okay. If that's if that's a going rate, and then we'll kind of go from there. Keep him motivated. Keep the yeah. keep the carrot keep the carrot dangling a little bit. That's exactly right. Not not every not everybody has a different sort of carrot, as you well know, Kratzy. And um, some guys are very self motivated, and some guys are not. And that's the reality. They're everybody's different. They're all, they're all different humans. Somebody might be motivated by wanting to stay in a certain city. Somebody might be motivated by, you know, wanting to, you know, do the best for their family or whatever the case may be, but, uh, or their own pride, or they're just great competitors. Um, 
but everybody's different. And I think that's one of those things that you sort of have to sort of assess and find out about the player. And that's part of doing your evaluation on the player's uh, makeup. Watching you as a GM, getting to know you now after you've been a, my my boss and, you know, throughout, you, you make connections, you make connections with people. And whether you're right or you're wrong, you're probably right more often than you're wrong, but you'll admit that you're wrong. Take us through the process of the Ryan Howard signing. Yeah, so the Ryan Howard signing was um, we tried to basically get out in front of what was going to come, what was coming. Uh, if you remember, um, there was a, was a Joey Votto and uh, Prince Fielder and also Pujols who were coming. And they were going to end up signing some big ass deals. <laughs> and we had the best player for, for the first for five or six years, literally the best offensive player in the game playing for the Phillies and we wanted to keep him. And we were hoping at some point, even if he's not a first baseman, at some point there was going to be a change, perhaps he'd be a DH, whatever the case may be. Um, my biggest concern was his long-term health just because he's a bigger bodied guy. He just didn't know whether he was going to continue to produce, but he did try to take care of himself as well as possible, which is what he showed us up until that point. But again, one of the most productive players in the game, if not the most, and so we try to get out in front of it uh, by adding another five years. He had two years left on his deal. Those guys ended up sending, signing 10, 11, nine-year deals, whatever the case may be. And in fact, you know, you can't, I mean, you can't do anything about somebody's health. Typically, the risk on a, on a position player is much lower than the risk on uh, a pitcher, obviously. And we felt like the risk was worth making the, the aggressive move to try to sign him to a deal that we thought was going to be equitable for both sides. Um, it didn't work out because the son of a gun, poor guy, ends up blowing out his Achilles. And then from the rest of his, from the rest of his career, kinetic chain, whatever the case may be, ankle, knee, hip, he just wasn't able to be the same player because he couldn't use his lower half the same way. Simple, simple as that. And uh, he ended up, you know, not being nearly as a productive a player because he was not able to use the most important part of his game. And, uh, and that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, I felt badly for Ryan himself because he's such a good dude. He's such a good person. And I know he wanted to produce because he's not one of those guys who is, you know, satisfied with his work. And he just wasn't able to be the same guy because he just physically couldn't get it done. Completely agree with you. I complete. I can't believe I agree with you with so many things. But <laughs> <laughs> We can disagree, man. I got no problem I would, with that. I know. I love, I love disagreeing with you. But do you think the shift originated with Howie? Because he was, you know, before I was a Philly, I was a Philly fan. And so I followed what he did. And he was legitimately the best, uh, the fiercest offensive force. Teams built their rosters in their bullpen to take care of, yes, obviously, smut to, you know, chase to. Two lefties. But, you know, but they would bring it. Burdak had a great career because he stayed in the <laughs> NL East to try to get this dude out. Do you feel like the shift was created because of Howie? Uh, I think he's one of, certainly one of the, one of the factors I know that, and that was something that we, he absolutely could not. And we know it's the irony of this is that when he was coming through the minor leagues, one of the things that he was not able to do consistently was pull the ball hard. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. And I remember having to send Charlie Manuel to go watch this guy. Cause every one of his home runs or three quarters of his home runs were to the left side of the field. They're all oppo. I mean, he had tremendous power, but he had, had not learned how to hit the ball out front consistently. And it's something that Charlie Manuel was very good at teaching. And I think it was either in the year he had in clear it was in, in, in Redding. Redding when he was, went off, where he really started to drive the ball to all fields. Now he could pull the ball more, more in a more relaxed way. And I just think it got to the point where he was not able to, and, and even when it, when he won, you know, the MVP rookie of the year, he had a ton of home runs the opposite way. He could drive the ball the opposite way with regularity. 
And I think it was just because he could stay on his legs and the ability to do that. And then the back path allowed him to do that. I think it just got to the point where he was in, unable to utilize his lower half such that every single ball, it was almost like he, he just, it was more of a hands and arms swinger than he was to, to be able to use his lower half to drive the ball in the air, the right to the right side and drive the ball more consistently to the left side. I think it was, but I think you're right. I think there's uh you know, I can't tell you how many line drives he hit right at the second baseman in right field uh, <laughs> or ground balls. Cause he just wasn't fleet of foot, obviously um, where he'd hit a bullet over there and get thrown out by the, by the right fielder, second baseman. Can't tell you how many current and former players like Ryan lefty pole hitters that you talk to now. And they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> like now <laughs> it's almost like yeah. you see an office space. The movie where they, they <laughs> get the printer, yeah. and they all kick the and shit. They start, out of it. <laughs> and they yeah. start that's the ship. That's, that's the ship that, with like that's that. Howard to Shara. Carlos Gonzalez. Yeah, the new guys, like Olsen, yeah. like all these guys that yeah. are just like, screw this thing. They're so. beat, they're beating yeah. the printer up in the field. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, Ruben, awesome catching up with you, man. It, it was great. Really enjoyed it. Appreciate it. And also just a quick Shout out to the MLB Players Alumni Association for making this happen and setting it up behind the scenes and head to baseballalumni.com for more info on your favorite former players and catch new episodes of Legends Territory every single week on the Foul Territory YouTube channel and wherever you get your pods. Appreciate you, Ruben. This was awesome, man. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Good being with you guys again and uh, hopefully we'll we'll do it again sometime soon, man. Would love to. Great catch. We'll see you guys. Thanks, Cheers. guys.